I just want to say welcome. Happy Friday. We are so glad you're here with us. We know that um, everyone's really busy, and so taking the time today to be here is really important, and so we are grateful for that. Um, and then I'll just go ahead and let me see if we have any new people. Looks like our old crew on the call. Not our old crew, but our our usual crew. I like that better. <laughs> there you go, Misty. Thinking about the older we get, the faster the time flies. Joking. <laughs> um, but anyway. Really, we just have a couple, <clears throat> I think a couple of updates on our end, um, and then we can hear from Tisha from the UAMS side of things, and um, a couple things I wanted to bring up, so we'll get it going. Um, so, I, you know, I just wanted to give a, <clears throat> a shout out to... Eastern Arkansas, they're doing um, such great work. They're really excited about incorporating COCM. They have hired a new BHCM that will start for them December 2nd. So that's great. Um, in doing so, we will plan to go down and <clears throat> spend some time um, with Eastern Arkansas. They'll have both of their BHCMs on board. So uh, the ABIN team will be going down there and we'll be doing some training with them. And then um, they are in the process of getting their psychiatric consultants um, on board and they're still uh, working through a couple of those pieces, but we are so close to having the team ready to go. And I think that that's an awesome piece. So um, another, I think, a anou big announcement on our end um, is, and I think most people on the call, we had the CFHA conference and um, that was the end of October. And I've been in a couple of calls since CFHA. And one of the takeaways is how, um, what a large presence COCM had at the conference and what COCM <clears throat> has, the presence COCM is having um, really on the national space for behavioral health integration. So that's exciting news for us, for Arkansas, for all of this work, because we are right there at the cutting edge um, preparing these resources so that primary care practices all across Arkansas are going to be able to benefit from this grant, the resources that are developed, the technical assistance that's available. So that's a really exciting piece um, of all of this. And hopefully Dr. Gibson will be able to join us, but I know that she went to a behavioral health technology conference in Phoenix this past week and really... Um, that conference echoed the importance of COCM as well. And also, um, as we're thinking about value-based payment and looking at the payment structure, um, COCM plays an important role in all of that. So that's a quick update. And here's Verna. Hey guys, sorry. No worries, we're glad you're here. We're saying we got a small group today, Verna. Lots of folks are out. But um, one thing I wanted to to ask, and you might have some pearls of wisdom for us. I was looking at the um, 2025 Medicare Physician Fee Schedule Final Rule mm -hmm. that was sent out um, and looking at a couple of things that are exciting to me. One, when I was looking at the primary care section, talking about developing new codes and looking at some pilot projects. Um, are they talking, do you know specifically, are they um, including COCM 
And then I have a question about the um, safety planning, the mm -hmm. new G codes that are billed. It's yeah. Interesting for me, because it says um, uh, the, the plan, the safety planning interventions are personally performed by the by the billing practitioner. Yeah. In a variety of settings. And so for me, if thinking about COCM and the COCM model, would that mean the primary care provider or would they allow the BHCM to bill that? Um, so it would have to, it could be billed directly by that care manager. We are actually getting clarification because that was my initial question. Like, could we have the primary care provider bill for those safety plan intervention and then also bill the collaborative care codes? My initial response from folks was no. So stay tuned on that. Mm. That'll be good for us, yeah, to get clarity on. Mm -hmm. Thank you. At least yeah. you're carefully reading these materials. Yeah, the other codes that people are not necessarily related to collaborative care, we lost the battle. Uh, well, we didn't win the battle to have the G code changed for the FQs to have them use the CPT code. So um, that wasn't necessarily super helpful. Um, but there's a couple of codes people might want to look at, um, the 99487 um, and the 99489, um, which are some care planning uh, codes. Okay. So um, complex chronic care management CPT codes that um, are there, so... Just something to think about. No, that's helpful. I think um, getting, you know, all of us getting a good understanding of this, especially as we're looking at how do we keep, how do we make this financially sustainable as the project goes along? So all that. I mean, to be honest, the big thing for financial sustainability, I mean, you don't have the Medicaid, but, you know, moving the Medicaid out or even potentially leaving it in to base based on the volume, you can be self-sustaining using just these codes. It really has to do with the volume. If you don't have enough patients, you're not going to be self-sustaining. But if you, I mean, we did it live with Tisha's, right? Like if you have the patients, you will be self-sustaining. Got it. Okay. We we hear yet, and our goal is 30, 60, 90. Yes. <laughs> if you listen to nothing else, yes, please. Yeah. <laughs> yep. We are listening. <laughs> <laughs> I, I smile and I'm, you know, I'm laughing, but I, all of this sounds so easy in, in practice. And, and then as we get in there and are changing cultures, um, mm -hmm. Sometimes things don't move as quick. Yeah. Sure, I'm not the only one. But. Mm -hmm. <laughs> awesome. Thank you for your information on those codes because I think that will be helpful um, Helpful information for yeah, us. Yeah, I'll share if there's anything, you know. Usually New. I flip it to CFHA and you, but I'll let you know. No, this is where I saw it come through. Um. All right. Well, I'm going to pause there and ask Tisha if she wants to give us an update and share anything exciting going on. Sure. Um, we, in the last three weeks, have um, hired and onboarded two new behavioral health care managers. So we now have four. We have um, Khadijah and Jennifer and Carson and Sam. They are, um, Carson and Sam are our newest, and they are um, doing all the fun onboarding things that happen at UAMS and getting all their trainings done, um, and uh, so it's very exciting. We um, have also our um, a psychiatrist who will be coming on board November 18th, 
His name is Dr. Sokol. He is ba he lives in um, Texas, but is uh, licensed in Arkansas. And we will have him forty percent. Um, and he will be uh, taking over covering for internal medicine. And um, then we, we are rolling out to um, Helena and Palm Bluff in the next three months. And then um, hopefully Helena starting in December, Palm Bluff starting in January or February. And then um, Texarkana is next. So we have um, site visits. Scheduled with um, Texarkana and Palm Bluff, and um, we had a meeting with Helena last week, and have got um, their they have their assignment of assigning their um, their uh, physician champion. So we'll get that from them next week and start rolling out with Carson with them, and then Doctor Sokol. Um, so that's going well. We um, have three months of kind of data that we supplied to SAMHSA from, um, for um, kind of our uptake at internal medicine and Palm Bluff. And so um, what I've been doing is really looking at our screenings and who got to our care managers and who didn't. And um, from our preliminary kind of look at the data, I mean, they're really good at getting um, our more higher, Acuity patients, so people who are above a 15, um, um, a good 50% of them are at least in touch with our, our, our care manager, our, our, uh, the social worker there, Nathan, and we had about 20% that got enrolled in collaborative care. Um, that's also counting, that's three months where one whole of that three month, our care manager wasn't even there, so it's really two months. Um, and then um, our issue is our, our, you know, our nine and above, a nine to 15s, it's a very low amount. So we're really going to be doing a push in Batesville with recognizing um, patients who score anywhere above a nine and getting them um, hooked up with our um, team. We're also, um, I've got a project in um, with Epic where we are um, changing our uh, uh, order where it's going to automatically have the consent phrase that the doctors have to click that they gave consent, um, that the patients gave consent um, for them to refer patients to us and um, streamlining that process for all of our clinics. Um, so I think that's really going to help, number one, with getting our consent, and number two, with making sure that it's easy for them to get referrals to us through the order process. So, um, Feel like we've made some really good progress. Um, I I read all of the notes that our care managers do, and it's just absolutely amazing to see the differences that they're making in patients' lives every day. Um, and so I'm trying to capture that so we can tell that story in a in an organized way, and also um, you know finding the gaps and um, outlining where we can where we can do better. Um, we've done a lot. We've we've learned a lot, and we're we're moving forward. As far as billing concern is concerned, um, we are right on the cusp. Um, but um, one of our uh, our doctors wants us to talk through to um, compliance about um, that the, we don't have because Medicaid doesn't pay kind of the legalities of. Um, charging some patients and not charging other patients um, and um, how, you know, how that billing would all go through. So we're, we're kind of on the, we're, we've got a lot of the pieces together and we're, and we're getting close, but I, you know, I think it is as, as Verna's study or research and, and, and writing has shown, it's very, very difficult to bill whenever all the payers um, do not um, pay because you know you run into legal issues of I, I you know we have to bill everybody we can't just pick and choose who we send bills to um, and I don't we don't want to exclude Medicaid patients from being able to be in our program um, we are a safety net institution and we serve everybody so it's really um, 
you know, becoming an issue. There was also, and I don't know if anybody has seen or heard, but, um, and I wish Medicare, I'm not Medicare, Medicaid was here or DHS was here because there was a little bit of a concern that I had heard from a meeting that UAMS was profiting or making money off of the services that we were providing and also taking grant money. And so, um, you know, that is, certainly not happening. We're not billing. Um, we'd love to bill. Um, and our goal is as, as, as soon as any of our people are um, self-sustaining, they would roll off the grant. We would absorb them and we would use the grant money to hire to expand um, until they were self-sustaining. So there's no double dipping um, happening if anyone has that consideration. So that's all the updates I have. I'm happy to answer questions. A lot, a lot going on. And, you know, I think it's important that we pause and think about, um, we just ended year one. And so a lot's really happened. I mean, to hear you say we've got four care managers, we have, you know, this large pool of patients, we're gathering the data, we're seeing positive improvement, positive outcomes. I mean, that's huge. And, and, and so I think, you know, of course we would, we all wanna, we have these goals and these deliverables that we set, which are important. And we, we will um, work to our very best to meet those, but also to pause and think about this is expanding um, across different Arkansas or uh, across different clinics in Arkansas. You know the AHEX that I think that I hear you talk about. This is really a rural, underserved area of the Delta that absolutely needs these services and doesn't have a lot of other services. So, Absolutely. Yeah, and I'm excited. We have a very, very neat crew. Um, our care managers are really, they're top notch. I've been so excited about um, being able to hire them. And they're all bachelor's level, which is a new thing too. Um, and, um, you know, so it's taken, it, we're, we're taking a lot of care to make sure that they feel comfortable in, in talking to patients and, and feel like they're supported and have the training. Um, they're all doing the AM Center training, um, the behavioral care manager training. I have some specific trainings that I have them do. You know, they have to get trained in Epic. And um, I'm personally uh, supervising all of them and co-signing all their notes. Um, just to make sure that they feel supported and can I understand what's going on. So when they ask me questions, um, so it's a big lift, um, but they, and at the same time, it's just been really energizing to get to work with them because they are really brilliant and smart and care so much about the patients and um, are great at working with the, our doctors. And um, I'm excited to bring Dr. Sokol on. So it's been fun so far. Um, the, the, the working with them has been fun. How about that? <laughs> the the uh, administrative HR slash other things are not quite so fun, but that's just part of it. One question I have, and we've, we've got Verna on, so Verna, um, you might want to speak to this. And I know Sarah Burns is on from... Michigan, and she might have some thoughts, but, you know, as I'm hearing Tisha talk about um, billing is an issue and cost of COCM is an issue, and we actually were having this discussion as, as a team this morning talking about um, insurance and billing, so our question is, have you all run into when there is a cost sharing piece that patients are responsible for, mm -hmm. how have you worked around that yep. um, and guidance, easy to understand guidance, because if we just say to the patient, you might be responsible for part of the cost sharing, call your insurance company to find out that probably isn't the best sell for the program. People probably won't want to, some might, but a lot of people won't want to do that 
Mm -hmm. services. And you they shouldn't need to really do that. Um, I mean, generally, the care managers after a month or two know what the copays are because they've heard from patients and that. But generally, the copay is going to match what you paid for your provider visit. So if I pay $20 to go see my provider, then it's going to be $20 for the month. That generally, Medicare, it's going to be about 36 bucks because that's, you know, it's going to be the 20% of whatever um, your Medicare rate is. So you do actually know it. And then for patients who have high deductible plans or that, you know, they're going to be paying for it. And then you can give them generally practices will give them the Medicare rates. And I would say then you follow your process. If I, you know, I went to the primary care provider the other day, I got a copay for my depression screening, which he did not do. And we're going to talk about it. I got a copay for labs. I got a copay for the visit, right? Like it was all broken down. And so, you know, it's a service you're providing you can't waive the copays, you know, for your commercial plans, but you could waive individual ones for hardship based off of your organizational policies to be able to do that. So whatever you do organizationally, you just apply it, you know, to here. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I had a conversation with the patient just last week about it, and even though we're not billing right now I, I act as if we are um so that we don't have to go back and retro but um she actually is self-paced so it doesn't have insurance right now and i talked to her a little bit about I me mean, she's really interested in, in in getting therapy and getting support for her um anxiety and you know i talked to her about um the that and she also wanted to be involved with our uh, with our team and you know as, you know told her about kind of how you know if you go out and you and you seek treatment that's going to be you're going to pay for every time you see them for us it's kind of a monthly pool together um mm -hmm. you know you will get a bill um once we are billing for um for that month um but it's usually you know it's the the going rates about 150 200 dollars for a month a treatment. Um, so mm -hmm. if you go to a therapist four times, yeah. you know, once a month or once every two weeks, you know, it's probably, it's going to be pretty similar. And here you're going to get, you know, as much care as you need for the month. And also, you know, the access to the psychiatric consultant, which, mm -hmm. you know, unless for some reason they really feel like they need to see you and, you know, you can say no, um, then, you know, they, you're not going to really pay to see them. You're just going to get their services. Um, so kind of thinking through like, you know, what would this, if you saw a psychiatrist and you saw a therapist even twice a month, that's going to cost you more. It's, it's going to cost you more. Um, yeah. Can I just go back to something you said? Cause you said therapy, you were talking to the patient about therapy. Is that because they were going to see a therapist and you were going to bill the psychotherapy codes? In no, that was just kind of there whenever we got the referral, like that's what they had told their doctor, like, oh, I, I want to go to therapy. And so the doctor was bringing me in to talk to them about the different options they had. And um, so that was their word they were using. Ah, okay. And I know, I think cost sharing has been waived by commercial blue cross anyway in yeah no no it has not. in michigan but not yeah. in any other state i was gonna say in michigan if you yeah. could talk a little bit about that i don't know if you know how that came about or i mean i don't think there's that much useful to say about it it, it would be a decision by the commercial insurer to waive cost sharing for these particular codes um so it could be a target of advocacy but uh, you know, that's a big lift. I think getting Medicaid to pay the codes and getting them to pay at reasonable rates is probably a higher priority for advocacy than getting commercial insurers to waive cost sharing, in my opinion. And I think we're on the road to Medicaid paying those codes in Arkansas. It's not a quick road, though. We need to we need to shorten that distance. Yeah, I mean, I'll also say, Verna, do you still recommend giving patients a range based on the number of uh, add-on codes that could be billed, right? So if yeah. they get a 
uh, an initial month code plus an add-on code, you might tell patients, well, it, it's probably going to be between seventy-five and one hundred and fifty dollars per month if that's if their their typical visit copay is seventy-five dollars. Yeah. If their plan is one that does that. So that's why one of the benefits of getting to that 60 patients in month two, aside from self-sustaining and all the other benefits that I always talk about, is then you have pretty much build across your entire payer mix and you have a sense of like, do they charge a copay for those 494s? You know, what does that look like? Because um, there are a couple of commercial plans that have waived the copays for these Um and so that will give you a good source of information. That's helpful. Any anybody? I'm just curious, um, Caitlin or Misty, any questions about that? I answered it. Um. Awesome. And it looks like we have a couple of new people. Sarah um, Matsumoto, welcome. We're so glad you're here. If you would if you wouldn't mind coming off mute, introducing yourself, we're a pretty small group and we'd love to hear about you and welcome you and have you be part of um, this work. Yes, thank you, Kim. I've been with my doula three years this month and started as a BHCM, moved into a supervisory role and then took over as PM of outreach and intake earlier this year and have since expanded my reach back over with the BHCM team. Most recently with Nicole's departure, um, Raquel and I are splitting her role in some of the duties and I appreciate you allowing me to join in this space today. Um, I was trying to catch up on what you were talking about and one question did kind of come up for me when you were talking about ranges here, and we've noticed that there's a big difference in providers where we have their charge rates versus allowables. And when we provide those ranges to patients, they're often very, very high. And we're just wondering how or if anyone's navigated this so we can give more accurate um, estimates to some of those patients that might be needing financial support or assistance. I don't know, uh, Tisha. What are somebody? What are you guys doing? I mean, I think we have maybe the the I don't know if it's the luxury, but at UAMS, we have a department where you know we can send people. They can call and you know ask about what their insurance covers, what it doesn't cover. You know, UAMS has you know as a as a safety net um, provider has you know mechanisms for which patients can can you know get things waived or have you know really really small payment plans and um you know UMS rots off a lot of care um now we have been in the news for not such nice um things that have happened um so I'm not saying it's a guarantee that patients aren't going to get uh uh you know things yeah. to build to you know to, to for collections but um in general, what I've heard and what I hope happens is that that we work with them and, you know, that if 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 there's an agreement in place and they're paying and, and, and that communication has happened, then, then patients get, you know, we, we work with them. So that's kind of where we go is, you know, we have this, please work, reach out to this program, you know, we can get you in and, um, you know, our, our goal is not for you to have to go bankrupt to get care. Yeah. You know, I think one of the things that's so important too with collaborative care, especially is that it's not supposed to last for a long time. And so if it is, then, you know, we need to be re reassessing. Um, and a lot of, you know, if it, and so with patients, like really, you know, we're going to work hard to get you better or in a, you know, where we, you know, where you want to be as quickly as possible so that um, this isn't going to cost a whole lot. Um, so those kinds of things too. Absolutely. Yeah. And thank you. I know we are using MD save with some of our programs, mostly with CHS patients and just 
working with providers for payment plans and that sort of thing, but I was just generally curious. So I appreciate that as well. I mean, I've I've worked in private practice before, so I, I you know I understand like it's it's wild the way that you know, insurance like what we you know, what you bill is the highest amount that you can possibly get from any insurance, but then you have to pay you have to bill that to everyone, and so you know like as a part you know person we were billing I was billing two hundred fifty dollars an hour for my time because that's what one payer would pay, but then. When I had self pay patients, like you either you, you bill them that and then you, you can do sliding scales. But there's a lot of rules around what you can and cannot do as far as, um, you know, making specific, um, uh, you know, changes for some different people. You can't yeah. just wave co pays or you've got yeah. to do, you've got to be everything, everybody's got to get the same kind of treatment. And so it's, mm -hmm. it's really a, a, a difficult and complex issue for sure. Yeah, yeah, that's why to fold it into your organizational policy that way, you know, and it's a contract violation if you say, well, for, you know, our whatever patients and then the local prevailing rates and that. So that's why it's better. We have one process, we follow it, and this just gets folded into it. I also mm -hmm. think that helps to normalize for people. Even a lot of times clinicians will say, well, I don't want to charge for my services, right? Or I don't want to you know, put this time down because that means the patient is going to have a 494, you know, so you really need to say like, this is the service we provide and it falls into the, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for being here, Michael. We appreciate you. Well, and I think, you know, this is such an important discussion because, you know, and I will say I'm sometimes guilty of thinking, oh, gosh, if we charge patients, um, will we see the uptick? However, when we think about you have access to as many um, contacts as needed, and to help get you where you need to be, to help meet your treatment plan goals, and then access to a psychiatry who's reviewing your chart, making recommendations, providing those to the PCP. It really is an amazing service. It's just, um, I think sometimes if we're not working in this space, it could it might be challenging for a patient to see the the value. Yeah. And yeah. I think it's a struggle too, because a lot of times, not all the time, but a lot of times the patients aren't coming to the appointment for this specific issue. So, you know, like, especially mental health, they've already jumped through all the hoops. They're actively seeking in a lot of ways. I mean, sometimes obviously not, but most of the time. So there's an expectation you're going to pay for this, but they are come for their annual wellness visit, right? Which is free usually. Yeah. And now they're being told, well, you need this. Um, and this is going to help with these problems, but that's not why they were there in the first place. Um, and so it is a different, it's a different conversation. Um, it's a good point too. We've recently created, me and Raquel have created a document to help our outreach and intake team navigate the conversation when it comes up with patients or potential patients of, well, our, our youth therapy is the care manager, my therapist. And so what we found really helps navigate that conversation is talking to patients about the goals that they are looking to meet and what they're kind of working toward. And then highlighting all of the things that collaborative care can help them to meet those goals. And then also saying, you know, these are the limitations. If you were looking for a specialty type of therapy like EMDR, we would work to help you get that referral for a specialist to better meet your needs. But that's one thing that's really helped just in the last four weeks or so and getting patients and their families to understand the differences and the nuances between traditional routes and uh, collaborative care as well. I like that. That's a great point. I'm writing that down. Yeah, absolutely. Glad to con uh, contribute something helpful. And and this is just my own um, my own experience as a as a health consumer. Um, 
is typically when I when I go into the doctor, um, whether that's for my annual wellness visit or a sick visit, oftentimes um, they're not offering me any other type of um, option, service, a model like COCM or um, a PCBH. And so I think it's a lot of education and introduction of this, these are services that are now available in primary care and changing to this whole care team perspective, I think is an essential piece of that. But I might be going to an doctor's offices with antiquated practices. <laughs> Okay. Um, so no, this is, I think this is a really exciting piece of um, the work. And, you know, great, I'm grateful that we have everyone who's able to bring their experience and talk from their perspectives of this is what I see at my clinic, this is what I see with my patients, and things that we can try um, in order to prove to provide better care. Uh, I know we've lost a, a couple of our folks. People are running from meeting to meeting. Um, other thoughts, information, things that we wanna add? Caitlin, I'm gonna let you talk about upcoming events and then we can kind of take it from there. Sure. Um, I only have three right now, and Michael messaged um, me and one of them, and I appreciate that. No, he's gone. Let me see if I can share my screen real quick. All right, so... Um, Kim actually just sent this uh, a couple hours ago to us. It looks like CFHA is doing a, a BHCM training, um, a two hour training uh, virtually. I've been actually to a couple of her uh, presentations and they're very good. You should have been to Ms. Hernandez stuff. Um, I know I'm going a little fast here, but it's November 13th, so next week um, from 12 to 2 Eastern. And we can, uh, Misty's very good about sending out these links, so we'll make sure we get that to you. Um, this is, they're going to go over, it's all COCM, it's all for behavioral health care managers. Um, and it sounded like, again, I'm going to scroll real fast, sorry guys. Um, it sounds like, yeah, that it's either, it, they can be a seasoned BHCM, just starting somewhere in the middle. Um, it sounds like this will be probably pretty helpful training. Um, and as, as most of the things that come out of CFHA are, so <laughs> we'll make sure we share that link. Um, another thing going on is not necessarily just COCM, but this, I mean, we definitely do have these conversations within that model is we are, um, hosting our, our monthly webinar on November 14th on substance use and adolescence. Um, and just, he's going to go over some of the current trends and, and treatment strategies that, um, they're using, I believe this is in that new clinic, right, Kim? The new, um, mm -hmm. okay. And I know we call him Dr. G, correct? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, so Dr. G is going to join us. I actually heard him speak at um, another UAMS uh, event last, I think last month, uh, maybe September. Um, and he had some really interesting information about adolescents, some things that I haven't considered. I don't typically work with that population. So um, I think he's going to bring more of that to the webinar uh, next week. So um, you can access that. You can subscribe to our calendar here. We also have um, Jenny, our, our coworker, who sends out a reminder of that uh, webinar every uh, the week before, um, and the link will be in there as well. So you're already on our mailing list. And then Michael told me about their Northwest Arkansas Schizophrenia Conference um, that is happening January thir or 30th in uh, Fayetteville. I believe, I think it was, yeah, Fayetteville Town Center. Um, and I asked him, I don't think they have a solidified agenda yet, but I did ask if it was similar to what we had in Little Rock um, last month. 
and uh, he said it, it is in the same vein, but they did add a couple of new people, particularly somebody who's done research on psycho um, psychoeducation for family members with somebody in psychosis or who experiences psychosis. So um, that will be added. I'm sure they'll add the agenda soon. It looks like the registration is up and, and ready and we, we can give this to you as well. I will tell you, Kim and I went to um, the one in Little Rock and it was fantastic. They had amazing speakers and it was just, you know, I'll speak from my perspective. There were, there was leadership from UAMS from all sides of it, um, from all the way around the psychiatric institute and that. So it was just really nice to see such a, a big support for this conversation. Um, I don't think, you know, conversation about schizophrenia is really happening anywhere else in Arkansas right now on this level. So, um, and they brought, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of cutting edge, edge speakers and a lot of perspectives. They included a lot of family members of somebody living with schizophrenia and then somebody who does live with schizophrenia. So um, all that to say is if, if you didn't make it to the Little Rock one um, and you have the ability to travel up to Fayetteville, it is worth your time, I believe. So we'll make sure we get this link out to you as well. I, I, Vern has already left. She usually has some other uh, learning opportunities that I do not have access to. So I think we could probably reach out to her and just check and see if she's got anything um, on her horizon too that she can uh, share with us. But that's what I got. Awesome. Thank you, Caitlin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have to say um, the schizophrenia conference was amazing and living in NWA, I'll probably go to this one because it was, it was really good. Um, okay, any other thoughts or comments, questions, things you want to talk about, COCM related? That's all I have. It was great to kind of see what this space will look like. And I know um, Nicole had shared a couple of ideas with me too. So um, I look forward to meeting with you again and hopefully bringing a little more to the conversation and being on time, but thank you very much. And I'm gonna share, if it's okay, these training opportunities with our supervisory team and see if we can't get some, at least some people um, into those spaces as well. Absolutely. We would love nice to meet you. you. Thank you. Yeah, we, thank you. Are, we are a welcoming group here in Arkansas and um, are just grateful to have people who are working in this space and willing to share their experience because COCM is relatively new. I know Ames has their 20th anniversary, but I was looking at a report that was talking about different profiles of the age of different organizations doing COCM. And when you think about, you know, the, the work happening in healthcare, this is really relatively new. So we need everybody on board yeah. to, to share and, and help each other with their learnings. I'm yeah. learning every day. The same, same. I My master's is a mental health related degree, but my emphasis is in integrative models. So I love working in collaborative care. I love learning about it. So um, if any of you ever find anything that might be useful to me, um, I would appreciate an email. I think I'm on that <clears throat> invite now as well. But um, And if I run across anything helpful, I'll share it back um, with the team as well. Awesome. You. Sarah, thank you for joining. We're so glad you're here. Thank you. I'm excited. And again, thank you for your patience. I was helping out with a patient uh, situation this morning, but glad that I could get in and at least say hi and, and be a part of the conversation moving forward. Absolutely. Thank you guys. Have a great night. Take care. Bye. Bye.